what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, lovely to meet all of you. I, um, AJ, by the way, comes from Alan John Miller, if you want to know my real name. And, uh, and there's a lot of things I'd like to talk about with you this afternoon. But before we start talking about them, what I would like to do is to firstly challenge you a little bit about your own emotions. And the reason why I'd like to do that is because everything that you're going to hear today is going to be filtered through your own emotions. So what I would like to do is to show you where your emotions are, where they begin, and what kind of emotions that we can divide all of our emotions into. And so whenever you feel a feeling of anger or, or another feeling come up through something I've said, look at you can look at inside of yourself rather than looking external to yourself. Does that make sense? Because there are going to be many things that challenge you today. And uh, far more things than you are currently feeling will challenge you today. So um, I would like to just firstly explain to you what's actually going on inside of yourself emotionally and what you are made of. So to do that, what I'd like to do is just uh, draw some little diagrams, stick figure diagrams on the board and we will go through and obviously too what I would like is, is for you to ask as many questions as you like, this is interactive, alright, so don't feel afraid to uh, pipe up and start ask questions about anything that comes up and you can put me under any pressure you wish, whether I respond to your pressure or not, so <laughs> don't be materialist. Alright, what I'd like to do is firstly describe you as Firstly, your material body, right? And then you also have a spirit body. Are most of you aware of that? Yes. Most of you have had some kind of connection with spiritualism before, so you're aware that you've got a material body, the, the body you can touch, and this spirit form, and people see it, sometimes people, who of you are clairvoyant in the audience? Is there anyone who is clairvoyant can see auras? or see the outline around, so you would see the outline around the person and you can see that that is their spirit body or the emanation of light from their spirit body. But there's another part of you that I'd like to talk about mostly today and I will call it this thing here and your soul. That's what I'd like to talk about mostly today. And by the way, you are a half of a soul. You're not a complete soul. You're a half of a soul. And we'll go into that later as to why that's the case. But firstly what I would like to do is identify what's inside of your soul. Does that make sense? So what do you feel might be inside of your soul? That's, here's the soul. What do you feel is inside of it? Love. Love? Well, love is, a, love is what kind of thing? Emotions. An emotion. So let's say emotions. Anything else? Yes. Fears? Peace. 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 Peace is an emotion too, is it? Memories? Did somebody say? Let's write memories down. Anything else? Experiences, which really relate to memories, but they are sensory, so... How about uh, things you haven't yet done? What, what? Hopes. 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 Hopes and dreams, right, yep, aspirations. Let's write it down as aspirations, sorry. What about the things you are yet to do? Desires? You can put intentions with that, couldn't you, too? What you intend to do? Intentions? Now, you can see what we're doing, and we could add a lot more to this, couldn't we? Passions? Feelings? Who wants to keep going? You get the idea, though? That's your soul. You notice that I haven't included your intellect in your soul. And for good reason, which we'll look at later. 
But there's basically two different types of influences on the soul. There's influences that I call error, and there's influences that I call truth. And I'm not talking about your truth, or what you think are errors. I'm talking about God's truth, and what are errors or in disharmony with that truth. So in other words, anything that's error is in disharmony and I'm going to go three, with love. Right? And anything that's going to be truth is going to be harmonious. Alright. So you get the drift? You've basically got your soul, which is this huge container of emotions. And in this container of emotions and all of these other things, desires, passions, intentions, and all those kind of things, you have types of emotions that are disharmonious with love. Any idea of what a, an emotion that's disharmonious with love would be? Anger. Anger, okay. So definitely disharmonious with love. Why? Because it often creates a lot of trouble around you, doesn't it? It, it destroys what's around you often. Now, that, I'm not saying, by the way, at this point, to not feel your anger. Right? So please don't think that I'm saying that. I'm just identifying the truth of some emotions being in harmony with love and some emotions being in disharmony with love. Does that make sense? And you need to still feel all of your emotions, even the ones that are disharmonious with love. Now, today what's going to happen is some anger is going to rise in you. There's also going to be doubts. What would you classify that as? Fear. Is that fear? Is fear in harmony with love? No. Okay. What other kinds of emotions might arise if you're confronted with a belief that you yourself don't have? Doubt. 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 Frustration. Frustration. Now, are they all harmonious with love? No. So the key for you is to see that these are something within you, coming from an emotion within you. Does that make sense? I'm just going to present something to you. I'm here at your disposal to answer any questions that you want. I'm doing it for free because that's what I do wherever I go. And how you respond is actually going to be based on what emotions are going to be harmonious with love or in, dis or in disharmony with love. You follow me? Now that doesn't mean that I expect you to believe everything I say. However, it does mean that as soon as you get angry with what I say, then you're out of harmony with love. Does that make sense? Okay. So there are things I'm going to say that are just going to, like, just trigger you, right? And one of the thing, first things I'm going to mention is going to trigger you the most, right? And so, and so what's going to happen then is you've got to let yourself feel. What's the feeling? Are you angry or are you doubtful or are you fearful? What are you thinking will happen with my statement? And allow yourself to feel your own emotions. And if you can do that, then you'll keep an open heart. Remember at our introduction, Peter said to, to keep an open mind? Well, I, I'd sort of term it more like keeping an open heart. And the only way to keep an open heart is to be open to your own emotions. Open to your fears, open to your anxieties, open to your doubts, open to your anger, open to your sadness. And if you're open to all of those things, you will find today very interesting. If you're not open to any of those things, you'll find you'll want to get up and walk out. Right? And you're allowed to, by the way. I'm happy with that. You're giving your time as much as I'm giving my time. So if you feel that you've just heard something that you just cannot accept, then that's it. Like, I never want to see AJ's ugly mutt again. <laughs> then away you go. That's fine. I've got no problem with that at all. These are the choices you can make. You have total choice. And that's one of the reasons why I don't charge for anything I do. It's because when you charge, people straight away have a monetary thing that they're going to lose if they walk out. And so you are able to walk out without losing anything. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> because you might lose some truth and that would be a shame. Truth is very important. So, can we all see 
that we need to allow ourselves to feel. Whatever comes up. Now you might say, well, AJ, why are you, you know, why are you harping on this, mate? AJ, I thought of just one thing. Yeah? With that middle egg, yeah. could, would destiny be a part of that? And later, later, when we're talking about the soul and the, all of the construction of the universe of God, and we will actually talk about destiny a little. And we'll find actually that it's more to do with free will than destiny. Life is far more to do with free will than with destiny. You follow me? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll talk about why that's the case in a minute. What, what I want to present to you is a summary of the universe and how it all works and everything. All right? The kind of thing that you've probably been looking to find answers about most of your life. And you'll find that there are very concise answers for all of these things that you have experienced and also the things that you can seek to experience and seek to feel. There are very, very clear answers. How many of you actually feel that you're almost tired of looking? because or exhausted in the process of looking for truth. How many of you feel that way? Yeah? Where, where it's just another thing, and, and like how do I work out whether this is true or that is true or this is true? And in the end you sort of feel like giving up. Well, we'll also look at why that's the case as well. What's actually happening there as well. What, what's going on not only within ourselves but also within the universe as to why there seems to be this this uh, not enough truth in, in, the, in the world today. I guess that goes for diets and everything, doesn't it? There's 10,000 10, different diets and controversies and yeah. you could be seeking just in that area alone, let alone all the other yeah. parts. Yeah, and the big issues like love and those kind of issues. How many of you have been seeking a love, a truly loving relationship and not really felt like you've ever found one? <laughs> How many of you have been seeking a relationship that's totally truthful and honest and open and you feel like you've never really found one? So, so obviously, truth in our lives, most of us feel like we want it, but often most of us feel like we haven't got it. And uh, there's reasons for that too, which we'll talk about. Alright, well, we usually start with the hardest truth first, and that's the truth about me. Uh, so, um, and this is, you're going to find very difficult to accept, I can guarantee you. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm going to discuss the secrets of the universe with you is because I've lived my way through the secrets of the universe, and I've done that for the last 2,000 years. And I've only lived once on earth before and the person that I lived as then was Yeshua ben Joseph, or you would know as Jesus. So how many are feeling really stressed out? <laughs> and the person I am is Yeshua ben Joseph, or Jesus, from the first century. And I've lived a life of 2,000 years from that moment and I have 2,000 years of memories and feelings about everything that's occurred through that life. Does that make sense? And instead of, most people during this class finish up asking me, how do you know these things? And I try and avoid saying who I am in the, as part of the process because I find that most people find that very confronting. But I want to be totally open and upfront with you. So it's important that you know where I'm coming from. All right? Now you don't have to believe a word I say, and in fact, most people don't. <laughs> and I'm not surprised. <laughs> but there will come a time in the future where you'll look back on our discussion today and you'll see that I've been, that I've been truthful with you about, about that as well. So in that book, Power Versus Force, it talks about um, the power of consciousness or the level of consciousness. So if Jesus had 1,000, was it 1,000, he did not, his soul would not have needed to have come back to Earth to, um, to learn anything. 
All right, so first thing is you're expressing your doubt, and that's great. I am. <laughs> Second thing is that uh, most people think that coming back to Earth is a need, and that, and that is one thing that you will learn today that is not true. Coming back to Earth is based on desire for love, a desire to actually give love to others. And we, I'll explain how the process of coming back to Earth actually did occur. Many people today have uh, a lot of viewpoints of reincarnation. How many of you feel that some kind of reincarnation is possible? Or that you've experienced it? Yeah? <laughs> so the majority. Um, how many of you feel that um, you've lived multiple reincarnations in your life? Yeah. And how many of you can remember everything from that entire existence? Are you putting your hand up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking earthbound incarnations. You're talking reincarnations. Onto the earth. Um, yes. And we'll talk about the concept of reincarnation onto other locations as well throughout our discussion. The, the issue really when it, when it comes to reincarnation, I have written quite a lot on reincarnation and there's, I've got a free handout which is about a hundred pages long um, that you may wish to take with you. I also have brought with me some CDs and I'll explain the content of those CDs that are free as well. You can take those with you as well and just feel free to read the material about reincarnation that I've, that, that I've actually written. The reason why I bring up reincarnation uh, first up is because most people have a belief that of the Eastern philosophy of reincarnation. Do you follow me? Now the Eastern philosophy of reincarnation basically states that you return in order to work through your karmic issues. Do you understand what I mean by karmic issues? Right. Now what I'm going to say to you is that that, that viewpoint of reincarnation is actually not correct. There is a correct view of reincarnation and I will explain that. Now, again, with every single thing I say, I can feel your emotions, right? <laughs> I can feel those projections that are coming back to me. How you know, he's just a nut of wretch, right? I can feel those. So, we know, but the key is to just still remain open Remember that these are just your emotions. And because they are doubts and fears, remember you said that doubts are not in harmony with love, did you not? Well, so where is it coming from? A place of fear, isn't it? In the end. Now, if what I'm saying is true, there will be answers to every question you would have, wouldn't there? Do you feel that? If what I'm saying is not true, there would not be answers. So give it a bit of time and see what questions you ask and then see what answers come up. Now what, after I make a brief presentation, which will take around about, when I say brief, most people who know me know that that's around about an hour. <laughs> and then what we will do is we will probably have a break and then we will give you the opportunity to ask people who have passed right, some spirits who are willing to come and talk today with you uh, through Natalie. Natalie will be the medium for those spirits to talk with you. And we'll give you the opportunity to ask whether what I'm talking to, about with you today is truthful or not. Alright? So that means that you, if you have any questions that you don't want to ask me because you don't trust me because I think I'm Jesus, <laughs> that you can actually ask someone else about and gain some answers about those questions that way. You follow me? Okay. Relaxed enough with that? Okay. What I want to do is give you a summary of the universe and how the universe was constructed, but particularly how it relates to yourself and your own construction, if you like, your own creation. And then what is ahead of you as well. Uh, I want to talk about that too. So let's get started. Everything begins with... How many of you feel there is no such thing as a personal God? As a personal God? Yeah. 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 Yeah
person, like I don't mean as a person like us. I mean as an entity. Uh, how many of you feel there's no such thing as an entity that has emotions and feelings and desires and passions that is God? Yeah. Do you view God to be more like the universe? Yeah. So, uh, sort of like a more impersonal viewpoint of God. Um, I feel like an energy. I think it's more of just an energy. Just an energy. Yeah. How many feel that God is just an energy? Quite, quite a number? Like. I mean, as opposed to something like in Catholicism, where is a strong male figure. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, he's not granddad, right? <laughs> it's the emotions, it's that energy as well. Emotion is energy in motion, obviously. Yeah. So, so um, if God is love, then you know these emotions, then his energy and vice versa. Well, let, let's look at the issue of God. Is God just love? Mm. Yeah. No. God is yeah. everything. So what's the answer there? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, God is just love, some yeah. feel? Yeah. And some he's feel, no, he's not just love. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say that one of the attributes... Of God is love. Do you know what I mean by that? One of your attributes is love too. In other words, one of the qualities that can come from you is love. But it's not the only quality that can come from you, is it? What other qualities could come from you? Positive ones, I'm saying. All positive. Compassion. 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 Desire. Joy. Justice. Justice, yeah. Wisdom. All of these things can come from you, can't they? So you are capable of love, and you can give love and receive love, but love isn't the only thing you are capable of. Does that make sense? Yeah. There are other things too that you are capable of. The same applies to God. One of the biggest qualities that God has is obviously His love. Or her love. But she also has a myriad of other qualities as well. Qualities that as yet no one in the universe has even, has even explored. Qualities that even the most advanced beings in the 22nd sphere of the spiritual universe have never ever explored. So there is this huge, God is this infinite being of infinite attributes and qualities. Can you describe your own feelings of what you feel that God is? Um, we would spend the rest of today <laughs> with my answer. And let's just start with two basic things though. The first thing that I feel from God is this aspect of absolute truth. I call it his divine or her divine truth. You follow me? But do you know if it's a he or a she, or do you feel that? Why do you say he or she? Then? Because there are times when the emotions I feel from God are feminine, and there are other times when the emotions I feel from God are actually masculine. So I know that God has both masculine and feminine qualities. Does that make sense? Right. So, the reason why I know that God is like that is because I can feel those emotions pass through me from God. And when you develop yourself in the way that I'm going to suggest to you, you will also feel these emotions pass through you from God. And so you will know the truth this way. And part of our explanation will be how do I know that these things are true besides my personal experience? Well, the personal experience is based on emotion and passion and desire and longing. And when you enter into that personal experience with God, you will also know what is truth and what is not. Do you follow me with that? The way to determine truth is to, to actually maintain a permanent connection with God and through that connection, God will tell you truth. You don't need to have any other source. You think about it, 
This is exactly the same way that you tell your children truth, is it not? The way you tell your children truth is they come up, mummy or daddy, what's this, what's that? And you tell them what you know, do you not? Why wouldn't you, you, why wouldn't you expect God to do the same for you? How do you know that you're not just assuming something? When you think you know the truth, you could just, it could be an assumption. Uh, well, if, we, if it's intellectual, certainly it will be an assumption. Certainly. But the way we determine truth, which I'll go through later, um, is emotional and not intellectual. And it will not be based on assumptions. We'll talk a bit more about the whole thing first, the summary, and then we can ask these kind of questions. So everyone understands that firstly, God, this, I'm going to call God a being, a feminine and masculine being in one unit. You could think of God as the great oversoul of the universe, the source of everything in the universe. God has two primary things that you can actually feel. One of them is the absolute truth, and the other one is her divine love. Right. Now, everything we discuss today, from now on, will be based around those two qualities in particular. Now, obviously, we could discuss many, many things about God, but what I want to do is give you a summary of the universe, not just of God herself but a summary of everything God has actually done for you as well. So that's why I'd like to move on to it. So God created all of these images of herself. You could call them little souls, little baby souls. Right? Every one of them have masculine and feminine Qualities. Not in even proportion though. Now at that stage, and by the way, at one stage in your pre-existence here on earth, you were in that state. Who of you remembers it? <laughs> I don't either, by the way. <laughs> so before my first incarnation, and before your first incarnation, you did not remember that state. Because you don't do. You can't connect with that state now. I had, I had a vision of it in a, in a meditation and I never understood it till now. Yep, yep. It's a, quite often spirits who are with you will give you meditation type experiences explaining to you your, you, your pre-existence. Yep. If this is the pre-existence, is this also the existence between does it seem on? Uh, no. It's only the once. It's only the once. The very first time. The very first time. The very first time, the reason why you don't have any consciousness of it uh, is because you are yet to understand quite a number of things that God has created within you. The first thing is you, that you have no memories. Right? So there's no memories at that point. You are also not even conscious at that point of your own existence. Who of you were conscious of that point in your own existence? You're not, are you? So obviously we were never conscious at that point. So we had no consciousness. Of self. You follow me? We did not know who we were yet because we didn't even know we were alive yet. We had not yet experienced anything. Does that make sense to you? Yep. But not everybody's, not, not everybody's there at once, are they? Like, are and they there was a time historically where billions and billions and billions, in fact, un, you know, almost an infinite number of souls, was in that state. So does that mean there's still ones that haven't yet? Their yes, certainly. There are still ones in this area of the universe that have yet to actually have any experience or any consciousness of their own experience. When you get to the 21st, to, to the 22nd sphere of the spirit world, you'll actually see them. You can actually see them in this state. You've seen them? 
Yes. And how many are there? Still, there are, there are, oh, I can't count them. Uh, and by the way, you can count pretty well when you're in the 20 second sphere. <laughs> uh, so there, there's, there are millions and millions of millions of souls. Uh, and an infinite number of souls. And, and there is, no one's really still aware of whether they are still being created or not. Because they don't only populate Earth, they populate other planets prepared for, for the incarnation of man as well. So it's not just, incarnation doesn't occur just here on Earth. There are other planets in the material universe that incarnation occurs onto. And all these souls are there. So is that um, like humans in this form going to other planets or...? And the soul is not in a human form for a start. Um, however, the, the human form on each one of these worlds is identical oh. in nature. <coughs> <coughs> but the soul itself is not human in the sense that it's not a human form, it's not something you can physically see. You only begin to see it through your soul perception. <coughs> now I'm going to say something else that's going to challenge you at that point. They have no... No free will at that point. Now. The reason why I'm saying that is because they are not conscious of self. So if you're not conscious of self, how can you know what to choose? You can't, can you? Isn't choosing something dependent upon you being conscious that there is a choice? But baby doesn't choose either, does he? Um, in what way? You mean choose to incarnate into a mother? Well, or choose? Baby reacts. Uh, no, from choose. the from the moment of incarnation, you are making choices. And the incarnation doesn't occur just at birth, it occurs at, soon after conception. Right? So you're making choices from that moment. From the soul? At the soul, soul level. Self. Yeah, at the soul level. The soul is absorbing emotions from that time of incarnation onwards, and we'll talk about why in a minute. So you can think of all of these as all these blank souls, right? You get that? The souls. They have personality, by the way, so they do have personality. And certainly have individuality. But they are not yet individualized. Do you understand the difference? Where does all that fit in with the notion of there was never a beginning, it always ever was, and it always ever will be? Um, yes, it, the notion that there was never a beginning came from, originally, from people who decided they could not understand God. And so what they had to do was they had to come up with some concepts that defined their own existence. And one of the concepts is this concept that the universe expands, contracts, expands, contracts continuously, and as a, as a result, all of these souls, or you yourselves, are all born, die, born, die, born, die as well, as part of this process. And it comes from those kind of doctrines and teachings that were established tens of thousands of years ago and we still have a lot of them today and they are based around not understanding how God could exist. So those souls there, that is the beginning of time for them? For them. The instant that God has a desire is the instant that whatever God desires is created. So whenever she desires to have children, whenever she desires to have children, she creates children in that instance. Does that make sense? There is no delay in anything God does. None whatsoever. And you will find this throughout your existence. And is there such a thing as then terminating the soul? The die? It is not known, actually. Still not known whether the soul itself can actually die. There, it is known that certain types of souls that have received God's love into them can never die. So there is, there, it is known that there is a way to obtain immortality, but if the souls do not connect with God, then it's not known whether they die or not. Does that make sense? Right now, in the spirit world, is one of the major discussions in the spirit world, is to whether the soul can actually die or not. So there's still a lot of things not known, right? Which you would expect with an infinite God, would you not? Yeah. 
All right, so, okay so far with that? AJ, does God have a personality for every soul? Every soul has a unique personality. And that comes from God? Yes, yes. Every soul has a unique personality. And part, and part of your role, if you like, or part of your process of discovery on earth, is discovering your uniqueness. Discovering what it is that appeals to you, that makes you more, that makes you unique to yourself. And that's something that you will learn as you grow. Have you met one of these individuals who, with God's grace, will not die? Um, there are billions and billions of them in what are called... Currently the, on the planet. Uh, not on the planet, but in the spirit world. Billions and billions of them. Yeah. When I say never die, I'm not just referring to this planet. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the soul dying, not, not the body of the individual. The body is not you. You are not your body. You are not even your spirit form. You are, in fact, a half of a soul. And that half of the soul, as far as it is, as far as it is known, does not die. And I say as far as it is known because... There are once souls that have received divine love and we know that they will never die, but there are souls that have not received divine love. And we'll talk about why that's the case. Um, devil or Satan, was he once uh, one of those souls and, and did he not dis, uh, receive the divine love or why did he turn evil? Um, this is going to be confronting. There is no devil. Um, yeah, no, as a, you know, stuff like that, but no, as a, an evil spirit. There's no evil spirit who is the devil. You think about it, um, how would an evil spirit be able to control other evil spirits? If the controlling force of the universe is love, it's going to be impossible for a devil to control other devils of lesser of lesser evil. So why is there the, the, the devil mentioned in the Bible then? Um, man wanted to come up with an explanation as to why there was so much evil in their heart. And they've always, historically, tried to blame someone else for it. So is that Adam and Eve and, and all that story? So are you going to tell us the... The real story now, or <laughs> Certainly. There is an Ammon and a man, the first human couple, that populated this earth. Certainly. And you would know of them as Adam and Eve. You can talk to them in the spirit world. And they will talk to you if you get to the development where they can talk with you. But who might Eve then um, to take the apple or whatever fruit that was? No one made Eve do that. It's an, it's an analogy of something that actually occurred at their choice level, at their soul level. It's an analogy of a choice they made to actually reject divine love. We'll go into some of that later. Yeah. Hey, Jim, can I ask you, will heaven and hell created by man? And we'll go through that in a minute because you'll see in the construction of the universe how it actually is created. The best thing I can say at this point is that God created the potentiality of every place of existence but did not create the place. He waited until a man of a certain, or a woman of a certain development, created that place. In other words, you create what is where your soul's development needs to reside. So, uh, for example, um, man first, the, the only, there was only one dimension at one, place, uh, at one point of the spirit world. This, it was, it's what is now termed the sixth sphere of the spirit world. And man has created every other dimension through the potentiality of the soul. It's very important to understand that you are a most powerful creator. You are co-creating with God. This is one of the things that God has done to give you, to give in this gift of free will. Does that make sense? And once you understand that, you start understanding how powerful God has created you. <coughs> Is there any more questions so far? Andrew, um, 
in the uh, in the soul, image of the soul form, I suppose, uh, there's no consciousness, there's no free will. How was the choice made to take another step? There's two things at play, two very, very large things at play. Firstly, God's desire for each soul, and the second is the, the laws of attraction that are based around, you've all heard of the law of attraction, right? Yeah. Well, the law of attraction is much, much larger than what is currently conceived by man today on earth. The law of attraction guides almost every operation and even every mathematical operation that God has created is guided by the law of attraction. And the law of attraction determines how this soul incarnates. The law of attraction in particular of its parents. The opposite way around than what everybody says, right? Everybody says that you chose your parents. What I'm saying is that your parents, to a large extent, chose you. And we'll talk about how that occurs in a minute. It's quite a few different things, isn't there? That... Can I ask you a question? Because it is one that troubles me sometimes. Yep. Um, if in life you have the best intentions yep. and in love and fairness, why is it you get affected by, I mean, with the law of attraction, why is it you attract the opposite? <laughs> yeah. Uh, does everyone want to know the answer to that? Okay. I'll have a bit of a side from our discussion and answer that. What was your soul again? Passions, desires, aspirations, feelings, emotions. Emotions. Memories. Desires. Memories. Memories. And so forth, right? Remember, there were two influences. Mm -hmm. What were they? Error. Truth. Truth. Error. And error. Yeah. Now, none of this included your intellect. Very important point. The soul influences its two bodies. Remember I drew two bodies next to it. Yeah? The spirit body and the physical body. The spirit body has a brain. The material body has a brain. Right? When you pass, you will remember absolutely everything of your experience on earth. Absolutely every single thing. Because the information is not stored in that brain. All that brain is, is a way for your spirit form to control your material form. So, the information is stored in this brain. You follow me? It's stored in your spirit body's form. And all of your experiences get filtered through that into your soul. So the question, getting back to the question, why is it that I try my best to do a certain thing and the opposite happens? And the answer is very simple. There is an emotion or a desire or an experience or a passion inside of your soul that you do not think you have, that you actually have, that attracted that event. And it's that simple. For example? Uh, for example, let's look at uh, a lady who grows up in a bit of an abusive household and lo and behold she marries an abusive man. How many of you ladies have actually been in a relationship with an abusive man? Quite, quite a number. Okay. What's happening there is because of some injuries in her soul about unworthiness, she is attracting a person who wants to harm her and she is willing to see that as love. Follow me? That happens here, not in the mind. In the mind, she knows she doesn't want to be beaten around, right? She knows she doesn't want to be harmed and abused. But there's an attraction occurring that has attracted her to that man who is abusing her. And that attraction is based on feelings of unworthiness, being unwanted, being unloved, and quite a number of other emotions. While she retains those emotions within her, she will continue attracting men who will abuse her. Even though in here, she's saying to herself, I don't want these guys. Why do I keep getting them? Does that make sense? But here, the attraction is still occurring because the emotion still exists. The feeling inside of her soul still exists. How many of you have walked up to a dog and it's barked at you and been really angry at you, and yet another person walks past the same dog and it doesn't do anything? 
How many of you have noticed that? Yeah. yeah. Why does that happen? Because here you might think you're not afraid of dogs. But here, something's going on in your childhood that's created this attraction. And the dog is so sensitive to it that it will respond to it. Just in the same way as humans respond to it too. Does that make sense? That is the answer as to why. I know it's a very specific, uh, um, like, small answer. We have a whole, oh, I spend the whole sections of time, hours and hours and hours, in fact, talking to people about the laws of attraction and how what's going on here has nothing to do with what you attract. You see, many of the uh, things like, who's seen The Secret? The movie The Secret? Most of you, yeah? Um, while what, it, what it's trying to get across to people is, is truthful, it doesn't mention one of the basic truths, and that is that you cannot manufacture things with here, with your mind. You can only get through things with your soul, with this. It's the, the laws all operate upon the soul. Well, I'd like to get that to a bit later if I can. Is that alright? Because uh, I want to go through the process of a bit of summary because you'll start understanding a lot of these things as we go. Especially if you don't know what it is. Well, the law of attraction is perfect, and this, this is another comment I'd like to make. Your law of attraction will tell you what you are ignoring in your soul. So, that lady who's attracted the abusive man in her life, what is she ignoring? Unworthiness. Unworthiness. Mm -hmm. And how is she getting treated? As if she is unworthy. The law of attraction is already telling her the emotion she is missing in her soul. The emotion she refuses to see. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But she would also love her, her parents if she had a soul connection with them and if her parents chose her. Know, that would ignore her emotions and Well, it depends whether you're talking about God's definition of love or man's definition of love. One thing I'd like to state about God's definition of love is it is never, ever painful and it never, ever results in suffering. If you love somebody and you're in pain with it, or you think you love somebody and you're suffering because of it, it's not love you're experiencing. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's quite obvious when you think about it, logically. But when you're in the situation, it feels totally different to that, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah could you tell me the difference between the soul and the subconscious? Um, yes, certainly. There is no subconscious. <laughs> exactly. What people are calling the subconscious is in reality the soul that they're not knowing how to connect with. Their own feelings and emotions and passions and desires and intentions that feel so distant to them that it feels like it's their subconscious leaving them along. So in, the, in regard to that previous example I was giving with the lady who was getting abused, she's saying to herself, oh, there must be something going on subconsciously because whatever it is, I don't know. Is that, you can see that? She'd be saying that to herself here, wouldn't she? I'm not conscious of what's causing this attraction, so it must be subconscious. But in reality, it's the denial of an emotion that actually the law of attraction is already telling her about. It's already identified to her what is the problem. She just has not wanted yet to feel that feeling. It's pretty hard to feel the feelings of unworthiness, isn't it? So if you don't want to feel them, particularly if they're you know, they're very, very deep and within you from a very young age. Of course, you're going to want to deny them. And as soon as you set up an aspect of denial, what you are now doing is you are denying also the law of attraction telling you what is going on within your own soul. Alright, so if you do identify that denial, mm -hmm. how do you get rid of that? Well, it's There's only one way to get rid of any emotion. What do you reckon that might be? Feel it. Feel it and cry. Well, whatever it is, if it's uh, whatever the emotion is, it might be anger. So what do you do then? Punch a bag. <laughs> you know, it might be feeling of shame. What do you do then? 
you feel ashamed of yourself. That makes sense, doesn't it? Like every feeling needs to be experienced. The reason why you lock up an emotion, the reason why there are lots and lots of emotions in this soul of error, is because when we're very young, we're not taught to experience our emotions. You think about what you were taught when you were young. Weren't you taught to deny your emotion? Weren't you taught to shut up? Weren't you taught to be quiet when you were crying? Weren't you taught, like, how many different messages do we get when we're young? By the time we're five, we haven't got a hope to feel our emotions, really, have we? Because we've had so many lessons of denial of our emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Cry, get distracted. All sorts of things happen, don't they? Like, how many times uh, does our child come and we sit them on our lap and they're crying and what do we say? Shh, shh, what are we saying? Even shh, 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 and what else do we say when they say it's a little toddler? What do we say then? Oh, look at that train going past. Oh, look at that train. Yeah. Yeah. What are we doing? What are we teaching? To be distracted from themselves emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. What else do we say to them? It's not okay to cry. No. You've got to be a strong boy, right? Yeah. Or a strong girl. Or big girls if don't cry. If you stop crying, I'll give you this. Exactly. <laughs> Bribery. Bribery. <laughs> These are all the things we finish up doing with ourselves to get ourselves away from our emotion. Can you see the pattern? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the part of that every single day. I mean, you've got to move on. You've got to ignore things to get to the point you've got to be. No, not at all. I'm going to no. teach you totally the opposite. <laughs> Never ignore a single thing. Because it, it's the law of attraction and operation telling you what's wrong. If you need a job, you're employed to do a job and you've got to get there to do it. But you're allowed to cry at your job. You just don't think you are. <laughs> well, you could. There's a consequence. <laughs> so then, therefore, the unresolved emotions towards the end of your human existence in this body, what happens with that? They, they are all still within you when you pass. You do not lose your unresolved emotions when you pass. They remain within you in your existence. All of your memories, all of your unresolved emotions. Today we are going to talk to some spirits who have had fear, for example, in them. And when they passed, they had that same fear. And they spent many years in the spirit world still in the state of fear. Right? So you will not all of a sudden have this fantastic epitome and all of a sudden there's all of these emotions that you're holding on to right now are not going to be gone. The truth is what's going to have to happen is you're going to need to choose to actually feel them. It's a choice. Once you get through to the next slide, are you able to resolve those here unresolved emotions? Or is yes. that why you have to come back? No, you, in the spirit world you are perfectly able to resolve all of your unresolved emotions here. Right? So there is never any, and in fact when we, talk about, when we talk about reincarnation you will see there is no need to come back to experience your unresolved emotions. Today we are going to talk to some spirits who have dealt with their unresolved emotions and not had to come back to earth to do it. If they called to come back from a loved one, is it their choice whether they come back or not? When you say called to come back, are you asking from the point of view of reincarnation or are you asking from the point of view of visiting you? <coughs> well, yes, uh, they will respond based on their feelings. So if you have a feeling on earth that you want to talk or feel one of your loved ones who have passed, you will attract that loved one to come to you. And if they will come to you if they want to. And if they don't want to, they won't. Does that make sense? Just like you would do. So therefore, just moving on, that physical unwellness like a heart attack or diabetes yes. or a stroke, yes. or something like that, is just the unresolved emotion suddenly saying, I've had enough, I'm going to manifest myself in this way. Totally. Every single physical ailment you currently feel, every single thing that's happening to your body is a direct result of what you're storing emotionally. And a desire to not remember certain things in their past. 
because of the painful experiences in their past? It might sound quite like basic, but a lot of these things about soul attractions are very basic. Why is it that um, people have we been taught to, to move on, the past is gone, um, and be positive, move on, um, if we are... Uh, are not to ignore what has actually caused our blockages. Mm -hmm. um, this idea, move on. Where does it come from, do you think? Well, we've been talking every, every day from... Um, from? People who don't know how to resolve emotions. You think about it, isn't it exactly the same message that your parents would have given you in denial of your own emotions when you were a child? Mm -hmm. So why believe them now when they're just not your parent, it's somebody else telling you? All they're doing is denying their own emotion. Every time you hear this thing move on, I'm suggesting to you, you will move on when you fully experience the causal emotion within yourself. And that's totally different than experiencing the effect. Now, go back to our illustration of the lady who's in an abusive relationship, right? She could cry every day, and she probably is, right? Well, wouldn't you cry every day if you were getting beaten every day? Probably. Now, she's probably crying every day, but is she dealing with the unworthiness? No. What is she dealing with? The Yeah, the pain of being hit every day. The, uh, so the those kinds. She's dealing with what happened. She's not dealing with the causal emotion. If she dealt with the causal emotion, the unworthiness, she would no longer even be able to live in that relationship. She would just leave instantly. The instant she deals with that causal emotion. That makes sense, doesn't it? She would leave happily. She would leave happily, yes. It wouldn't be a trauma for her to leave. She'd want to leave. Yeah. When you deal with causal emotion, you get up and do it immediately. Ah, well, we're getting to that. And that's the bit I'd like to get to next, actually. Right. Let's look at the first, the very first incarnation process that you go through. In fact, your very first visit to Earth, if you like. Right? In this case, because you're all here on Earth. What happens is the soul separates into two halves. Hey, James, the soul feel, each soul feel that at that moment? And no, because it's not conscious of its own experience yet. Is it like a male and a female heart, or are there false There's lots of different combinations. Well, when you think about it, there's only three possible combinations. <laughs> you think about it. If you've got a whole complete, and it's separating into half, and it's separating into a male or a female body, it can only be either a male and a female, a male and a male, or a female and a female. Can it not? There's no other combination. You said they separate. So they were once one and they separate. They were once right. one soul and they separate into two halves. You are right now one half of your soul. For what purpose do they separate? Uh, we'll get there. Same <laughs> Yeah. There's months worth more. Oh, so it's a animals and rocks and plants. No. The soul can only incarnate into a human form. No. Each, each half of the soul has an individuality. Each half of the soul has an individuality. I'll just get back to that question about animals. The reason why you sometimes think that somebody might have come back as an animal is because there is a law of attraction at work between the person who's passed and that animal that you feel. Your friend or partner or child or whatever that you may feel is that animal actually is a spirit who loves that animal. Do you follow me? And as a result you feel that coming from that animal. The animal behaviour will actually change based on the emotions of the people that are surrounding it. And when I say people I'm not just talking about earth-based people, I'm talking about the souls that are surrounding it. That makes sense? Sort of? No? Your question statement? Yes? Yeah, I'm just saying about the, the soul. 
half-souls have individuality. And, uh, they only have individuality once they've incarnated. Because they, when you say individuality, let's, to term, let's separate two things. There's individuality and then there's individualization. <coughs> individuality to me is like differences in personality. All of us are all individuals. Your halves of your soul are individuals, if you like, of the one whole. Right? So there's different qualities in each half of the soul that when it emerges will make the one complete. They are called, what do you reckon? Soulmates. Soulmates. So, um, so when God created the whole soul, the passions and desires that are in the soul, um, can, are they similar then because of the soulmate male female thing? They will be similar and then complementary. Complementary, uh, that's the word, yeah. Yeah, yeah. similar or complementary. So, when your soul joins back together, yep. what happens if... Oh, We'll get to when it joins back together when we come up through this. But um, what happens if one half of the soul led a really peaceful life and one half of the soul didn't? Well, the, the soul combines even with all of those emotions. Uh, but there's a process that the one who lived a non-peaceful life, a violent life, that they will need to go through to work through some of their emotions. But those memories will be retained by both <coughs> the complete unit at the end. But every memory, you think about it with your own life, you have memories that are emotional, don't you? And you have memories that are no longer emotional, don't you? Why? Because you've dealt with them. And it's very much the same here. Eventually you get to the stage in your progression where you have all the memories of your existence but no emotional attachment to those memories because they are now dealt with. They become a part of your experience and they've defined your personality but they are no longer something that you get emotional about. So, for example, you've all heard of Luther, the founder of the Lutheran religion? Well, when he was on Earth, he had some pretty bad viewpoints. Did you, did you know that? Oh, yes. I know the recent movie about him sort of painted him with a glowing portrait, but he had some terrible viewpoints about women. He, he called women subclass, and he said the best way to keep a woman was to keep her in the home. And barefoot and pregnant, yes, there's an extension of it. Now, Luther is now one of those spirits that I have mentioned who's up above what's called the eighth sphere of the spirit world. And and he's he's in the celestial kingdom. He is actually at one with God now. So he had to go through the process of working through those emotions. Does that make sense? Alright, this when they incarnate. Obviously, the material bodies and spiritual bodies are created by what? <coughs> that lovely thing called sex that all of you want to do. So genetic, your genetic creation at the spirit body level is created at the same time as your genetic creation in the material body level. A spirit form and a material form is created at the same time. And the soul incarnates. Now, when, you say, when I say incarnates, there's this viewpoint that most people have that goes inside somehow. The truth is that the soul actually attaches itself to those bodies. Isn't the soul all around? Sorry. If this is a soulmate, they have to be born on the same day then, basically. No. Oh. No. Because if they incarnate, if they get split up, <coughs> it's not half a soul floating around somewhere. Yes, there, there is. Yes, there is. When What happens is the riskier half of the soul incarnates first, and the other half of the soul remains in this soul state until it is attracted to an incarnation as well. Now there might be a gap of up to even 20 years between those two events. What do you mean by riskier? Sorry? Okay. What do you mean by riskier? Usually one half of the soul has a, has a more riskier nature, a riskier personality, part of the personality. Okay. And it's that half that incarnates. Where's the other half of your soul? Uh, on Earth. Do you know who it is? Yes. 
You want to know? Yes. yes. No, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason why is because she needs to go through this whole process of emotional, uh, this emotional process too. And obviously if she's got the projections of lots of other people doing that, then it's going to be very, very difficult for her. So, so but I do know exactly who she is. And, uh, How do you know that? I knew the instant I looked into her eyes. Uh -huh. So, was it the same for you in your first incarnation? Yes. You knew the instant you looked into her eyes? Then? Yes, yes. So, where are we always the male and the female? No. The Apostle John, uh, you would have all heard of the Apostle John like from the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Apostle John has a male soul. Who was your first? Sorry? In your first incarnation? Yeah. Which person or was your... Was I'm happy to tell you that. That was Mary Magdalene. <laughs> That's as far as I'm going to go. What happens is that as you get rid of all of your soulmate-based injuries, you will be able to recognise your soulmate. A lot of attractions on earth at the moment are based around injury attractions. In other words, my injury is compatible with your injury, so we get together. Mm -hmm. right? Now, when one of them grows, what happens then? The relationship disbands often. Mm -hmm. right? Now, a soulmate relationship isn't like that. A soulmate relationship is not based on injuries. In fact, the lady who is my soulmate now, my soulmate always has been my soulmate, by the way, but the physical form she is in now, I would not normally have been attracted to because of my injuries that I've retained during this experience. Are there many soulmates you could have in the world? No. Well, how do you get trapped and on the other side of the world and the different religions and can that happen? Certainly, but what happens, if you understand the soulmate process, what happens is the first half of the soul incarnates, right? Now, let's say it's a baby and then it moves to another country. What will happen is the second half of the soul, there's a, there's a very, very strong law of attraction between the two halves of the soul. And the second half of the soul follows around, if you like, the first half of the soul. And when it's ready to incarnate, when I say ready, it's based on the law of attraction from parents and so forth, it incarnates very close to the location of the first half of the soul. But of course the first half could move back to its original home. Right? And then they might be a world, you know, the whole world apart. But the law of attraction operates in such a way that those two will eventually probably meet each other during their lifetime on earth, in particular if they are sensitive to their own emotional state. Um, there is really only one lifetime. I've really only had one. The soul, remember, I'm talking about the soul. The soul is the real you, so there is only one lifetime. Yours, right now. Why is it so many people don't meet this one? Uh, because of the injuries. The more, the more injuries I have, I can walk past my soulmate in the street and not recognise her or him. If one half dies, or, you know, you know, Yep. No. Split up again or? No. 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 By the way, the two soulmate halves can recombine here on Earth. It's never been done before, but they can. The two halves of the soul can also recombine even if one half is in the spirit world and one half is on Earth. And the two halves of the soul can recombine in the spirit world, and that certainly has been what done many times. How does it What does it mean? Well, let's get to there first. We've got okay. the, it's a fair <laughs> bit between here and there. <laughs> so let's do that. So that's the process, so that process I would call the process of incarnation. Does that make sense? Incarnation. Is there a reason why God made that so complicated? Or why is that so? It's actually not complicated, it's quite simple, isn't it? The carne in Italian means meat or flesh. Yeah, and what actually is happening is that the way God created it is that the earth where we're living is the nursery of the soul. This is where you learn your beginning lessons 
of the soul that God wishes to teach you if you choose to make a choice to be taught. Now, the reason for the incarnation into the material format first is because it is the simplest of all formats of life. And so that is the one you incarnate in the first. At the moment you incarnate, you are now individualised. So if a woman uh, had an abortion, for example, or a miscarriage, it's a soul you're miscarrying, not just a, a fetus, but actually a soul. And those souls pass into the spirit world and are looked after by other mothers. Because I've already been individualised. I've actually talked to some who have been looked after. Do they come back? They don't need to, no. <coughs> some, are, some will choose to, but they don't need to. Just a comment, it's really quite a loving thing that God does, isn't it? Instead of just putting all these souls down and saying, well, go fend for yourself, he's made a perfect, perfect... Partner. Exactly. Your soulmate is going to be your perfect partner, mm. but only once you've dealt with the emotional injuries. <laughs> the soulmate can also, with emotional, excuse me, <coughs> with emotional injuries, the soulmate can be your worst nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> well, you imagine if your soulmate, you know, was a murderer and a, and all of those things, and obviously he's somebody's soulmate, right? So, it might be yours. <laughs> there's many instances in history where this has occurred. Um, you've all heard of Nero, the Roman Emperor Nero. Yep. He, he, he murdered his own soulmate. Yeah. So, they had a few issues to work through. So, is that when he's a spirit then? Yes, yeah, she passed into spirit. She was a Christian in the, in the first century. She passed into spirit, um, and and he passed later, and she took nearly it took nearly a thousand years for them to get together. And she was very patient, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> she no choice, had yeah. So she she worked through all of her emotions. She was in a place called the celestial heavens, and he was still in the place that people call the hells, and uh, she went down and assisted him to get to where she was. It's a beautiful arrangement, actually. It gives you two chances to do everything. Mm. Uh, why, why do they want to be together, the two, two halves of the circle? Um, you don't feel complete without the other half of yourself once you get into a state of one with God. Um, so when I say complete, I don't, mean com I don't mean completely happy. You are completely happy. So I'm completely happy to live without my soulmate. <laughs> But I don't feel complete without it. Do you follow the difference? So, is there a point in time in the schools or wherever um, that people have a um, spirits have a feeling for who their soulmate is? Like, um, yes. Usually, it occurs in the fifth sphere of the spirit world, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right. Let's uh, progress, shall we? Incarnation. Everyone's. I know you'd have lots of questions about that, right? Every one of these things that I'm raising, you could ask, honestly, you could spend three or four hours discussing each one and still not know everything there is to know, of course. Like, I've spent 2,000 years investigating these things, so it's not going to all be covered in a few hours, right? Is time here the same as time here? No. No. Um, and in fact, there's different dimensions where time actually changes, uh, things about time change. And we'll talk about that too. Do the two soulmates have to like get together like romantically, or they both be married to different people, but like, still be Eventually, they will desire to fit together romantically. So I've 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 been single for four and a half years, waiting for my soulmate to appear, and she appeared a few weeks ago. Right. Does she know that? No. <laughs> 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 All right. Let's say, uh, let's see what happens about this. As you said, we can talk about that subject for hours, but not even yourself. Uh, you've obviously just fallen in love, like the rest of us can do and have done a couple of times, and you think it's your soulmate, you know, for the first. <laughs> no, I, I haven't just fallen in love. I've been in love two thousand years. <laughs> 
I just recognised it. I see who I saw who she was in this incarnation. Is that the same person as like in your first reincarnation? Yeah, not the same physical person. But it's the same. It's the same soul. The same. Yeah. It always has to be. Sorry. It always would have to be. It always will have to be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But she's not aware yet of who she is. She's not aware yet of who she is at the soul level. She she feels an attraction for me, but she is a bit confused about it. So. Does she know who you are? Well, she knows who I claim to be, shall we put it that way? <laughs> what would you think if somebody came along and said, <laughs> honestly? Oh, he would say, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, it's not going to be like that. Did she go to her son, Mary, or Panty? No, no. Well, I don't want to scare her to death because. <laughs> But you can see the obvious problems, you know, like I'm saying I'm Jesus and, you know, naturally she's got some issues with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, so she hasn't had any memories? You only have memories when you allow yourself to feel your emotional state. You think about all of your memories. When you want to bottle up a memory, you bottle up the emotion and so you forget the memory. You, how many of you have had a, had a memory where there was something that happened when you were a child and you've gone through an emotional experience as an adult and remembered it for the first time for, for years and years and years? Most of you, I would have thought. And, and the reason why that is, is your, your memories are totally dependent upon you being open to emotionally experience each memory. Now, if the person is not willing to emotionally experience a memory, then they will not have the memory. And that applies for the rest of your existence. You will only remember when you are prepared to emotionally remember everything. So in the first, second, third, fourth spheres, it's the same there too? It's exactly the same in every sphere of existence. Even if it's subconscious? There's no subconscious. Okay, no, so if you're a soul, that even on a soul level that you've made a decision to experience something even though you don't know, like something happens in life and compels you to process a lot of things that you didn't expect and you're almost forced into it. It looks like you're forced, but you weren't obviously because it was attraction. But remember your attractions are based upon the unresolved and, resol and resolved emotions too that are occurring within your soul right in your current moment. So right at this particular moment, right now, all of you have attracted being here. Not, it's not just Peter who organised this. All of you attracted being here. There was something inside of your soul that caused you to desire to be here. You attracted that. What happened when you remembered your crucifixion? Well, um, it was a very emotional process for me. And it took, it took nearly uh, three months for me to process every single day. Was it agony? Um, yeah, I went through all the physical pains as well as all of the emotional pains that I experienced at the time. Yes. In this lifetime, how long have you known who you were? Um, when were you first on the My memories began when I was two, in this lifetime. Uh, but I was not prepared to accept them until I was 33. Funny, how is it? <laughs> and I'm now 44, so I've been processing them for 11 years. In your growing up at the time, did you have memories that you blocked in your growing up? Yes. And how did you resolve those? I didn't when I was growing up, but I, after 33 I began to resolve them by experiencing every one of them. So I've had to experience my life the process of remembering anything is about experiencing it all emotionally and I've got 2,000 years of that to do. Does that make sense? It's amazing you've got time to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to you is helping me process some of my emotions. Did your parents, when, when you, like you say, you started at two, so did your parents pick up things that you would say or do it began, you I had, react? It began, I trod on a nail when I was two. Mm. It went straight through my book and lots of emotions started coming up then, and confusion, and 
I had lots of fears as a result. I had part of my bowel removed because I was so afraid. And, and it just went on and on and on as I was going through different emotional things from that moment on. So it's a process of remembering everything emotionally. And of course at that age I had no idea what I was dealing with. And of course didn't want to either. I made a conscious decision when I was 12 to never, ever, ever deal with an emotion. And it took me till 33 to break through that result. But I had memories all the way through that. Will you tell us how to um, resolve emotions so that you are able to deal with them and um, that's probably going to have to be another day, because um, what I would like to do is just get go through the summary, um, so that you've got an idea of, of a skeleton, if you like, of everything that's ahead of you. But that um, woman that gets eaten up, she has to deal with these emotions mm -hmm. and to get rid of it and experience that, so it won't happen again. So how can we, if we have other emotions or whatever, get rid of this? Um, we, we've had, we have, I, I run many classes when I'm in a certain location where we go through how to actually do that. Um, and you're welcome to join those classes. I know you probably want to get on with it. I've written quite a lot of things about it that have been placed on a website as well and on the CDs that I'll be, uh, be giving you that you can read about the process emotionally. And the process is better with God than without, as you would imagine. So. My suggestion is connect to God and then work through these issues with God. Does that make sense? So, my suggestion is to read that material and see what you think of it. And I make suggestions about other. There's lots of material on earth today that help you connect with your emotions, not just my own. To connect with God, in your opinion, is that uh, through a certain religion? Or? Religion is mankind's construction of what God is. It's not God's definition of what God is. What my suggestion to you, and this is something that the spirits who are listening as well need to bear in mind, every time you try to define God, you are going to find that you're probably going to be wrong. It's only when you let God define herself to you through this emotional connection that we'll talk about, that is when you will learn truth. Well, where does the Bible fit in? Particularly written by your 12 followers, or uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't have 12 followers, and um, there were obviously lots of followers in the first century, and I didn't have a favourite 12 that I picked. And um, there, there are all the constructions of people who wanted to fit 12 into some sort of patterns in the Bible, and uh, there were some mathematicians who were involved in religious study, and they wanted to fit all these patterns together. The, but the Bible as it currently is, has been heavily modified from the experiences that I actually had on the earth in the first century. Now, again, I, I'm happy to have a session where you ask me any question about my first century life, and I can tell you anything you want to know. And you'll find some of it is in harmony with what's in the Bible, and some of it is not. And you'll understand where it obviously is being modified too once you hear the true story. And I don't really want to focus too much on myself, aside from the fact of just being honest with you about who I am, um, I, I prefer that you focus on your relationship with God, uh, because obviously all I am is the same as yourself. I'm just a child. The Bible talks about God, and that's written obviously by many people. There are certain truths in the Bible that are very true about God, and there are also certain errors about God too. You know, obviously anything in the Bible that refers to God being a God of wrath obviously is incorrect, uh, for example. Then there are many other examples I can pull out too. But much of the modification of the Bible occurred in the third century of the Common Era. And the reason why it occurred was that the emperor at the time, Constantine, wanted to set up a world religion because he felt that that was the way to maintain the harmony of his empire that was fragmenting because of Christianity. So what had happened is so-called Christianity grew from the time I was on earth to the third century, and there were so many fights and wars about the whole thing. Obviously, not Christianity, eh? Mm -hmm. But um, there were so many fights and wars about the whole thing that what he did was he tried to unify the the Roman Empire again by making it the Holy Roman Empire, making it religious. And uh, in the process of doing that, there were seventy or so men who got together who he chose 
and they determine what the Bible should contain. And in the process of determining what the Bible should contain, they chose many things that were in harmony with their own belief system, and they rejected many teachings and things that were written that were in disharmony with their own belief system. And my, my own soulmate in the first century wrote some books, and all of those were dismissed from the Bible. Only men usually contributed to the Bible. There are very few women. Even the, even the books that are named after women, even in the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures of the Bible, were written by men. Um, so, so there's a lot of distortion, historically. And as you know, his story it is really his story, yeah. uh, rather than the true story. And you'll actually find when you pass, that every single word in the Bible that was not originally there, you'll be able to identify. There are books in the spirit world that are accurate based on the first writings. And yes, there are books in the, in the spirit world. There are homes, there are gardens, there are... Music. Mu there's music, there's art, there's all of these things that you think are possibly not there. They're all there. They're in different dimensions, sorry? No, if if you depends what your condition is. So if your condition is like you're a murderer and a and really angry man or whatever, you probably won't even have a house. Um, there's a location in the spirit world. No, be careful there. A spirit is something you can't touch because the material that you have is very dense. In the, in the way that it's uh, constructed. And it's to do with the vibration of your physical body that causes it to look solid to you at the moment. To a spirit, your body does not look solid. They can actually see the flow of, they can see the organs and even if down to the flow of electrons, uh, they can actually see it flowing. They can see the energy emanating out of your body as well. They can actually smell it as well. So, Spirits have, um, the best way to explain it is like this. Here's the half of your soul, right? Here's your spirit form. Here's your material form. And I'm oh, sorry, I've got to do the dress thing for you, sorry. So here's your material body. And here's your spirit body. Most people believe that when you pass from a material world into a spirit world, that you have less sensory apparatus. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah. Most people believe that you have some kind of limitations imposed upon you by passing. The truth is actually quite the opposite. Every part of you has greater senses than the previous part. So your material body we often say has five senses, right? The spirit body has many more senses and the soul is much more powerful again. And then if we look at the complete soul, that is much more powerful again. So anything you can conceive now on earth is going to be very, very different in the spirit world, but better, not worse. Except if in the hells, then it's worse, isn't it? Um, well, I don't know. It's exactly the place where they want to be. But they feel gross and everything, like some of those books say. Certainly. The, material, the spirit body, when a person passes into the hells, is a reflection of their soul condition. And if their soul condition is quite ugly in the sense of disharmonious with love, then their spirit form looks ugly. And that's why you have people who look like, like monsters coming to people, sometimes children, often say there's a monster under my bed and all those kind of things and they, really, they feel it's real because they've actually seen it and it's a spirit in that condition. So children really do see spirits? Oh yes, for sure. All of you can see spirits. <laughs> you just don't want it. <laughs> At the moment, there's a feeling or an emotion in the soul that turns that off. Getting back to the subject of the Bible and the changes, um, and so it's not um, the whole truth, have you considered rewriting it? Um, I would rather just teach the truth uh, than try to change the error that's already there. Um, the, way, the, way, the way I see it is all error 
if you focus on the error and try to explain what actually happened, then the error is already in the person's mind as well. You're better off just telling the truth as it is. And yes, I'm very certain there's, there's, there's a lot more than just myself and Mary who've re returned. And all of us will be writing material that will explain what's going on and what actually happened in the first century as well. Is it just that you're not reaching out to the, to the population? Not That's yet, I am. There's a reason for that. What might it be? Not really. not they're not all looking. looking. They're not all searching for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're just not ready. <laughs> well, I'm not ready, firstly. And, and the secondly, the world's not ready yet either. There are lots of individuals in the world, like yourselves, who are becoming ready to even put up with me saying that I'm Jesus, right? And still stay here and listen, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so, I understand that. Yeah. And questions are fantastic. It's questions that are asked to debunk that are obviously not. So if everyone here was saying, was rubbishing me, then I'd just walk out and go home and wait for another opportunity. Does that make sense? But the fact that all of you are open just to ask questions is lovely. Oh. You and your soulmate yeah. have children? Yes. Wow. One. One. Four years ago. A girl. She was born after I died. Yeah. Mary was pregnant when I was uh, crucified. And her name is Sarah? Her name is Sarah. Alright. Yep. And, and where did Mary go after you Sarah is currently in Canada, by the way. She is one of the ones who is reincarnated to us. Sorry? Uh, firstly to Egypt and then to France. Yeah, and, but she was killed in Rome. Was she back in the world? Yes. Sarah, you mean? Or Mary? Mary is. And Sarah is too. And Sarah Sarah soulmate is too. Can you meet up with her? I have already. Yeah. 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 Ye
let your light shine between. What are we really talking about? We're talking about. So, where you go depends totally upon how much love you are reflecting in your soul. <coughs> now, it's not your definition of what love is. It's every. There are places in the spirit world. Best place. I'm going to draw them linearly, right, as a as a line, if you like, in a two-dimensional space. But in reality, they are multi-dimensional spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six. How many of you think there's seven? Have you read any spiritual material? Most people. Yeah. Most people say there's seven. There's actually not seven. There's actually twenty-two. So far, none. Uh, current day mathematics using supercomputers can actually describe the existence of these dimensions. These descript these dimensions are described mathematically currently. Um, up to a certain point, because the computational power to do it mathematically is, is quite high requirements. Let's look at what's happening with it. My, if my soul reflects love, then I will pass into a more loving dimension than if my soul reflects other emotions of hatred, envy, strife, jealousy, and so forth. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Now there are two forms of progression in love. One form of progression is limited at the sixth sphere. So I'm going to draw a line across there, and I'm going to draw a little sort of dots down here. Bear in mind these dimensions are not separated like with a line down the middle. Right? I'm just representing it diagrammatically. There are two paths of progression. And the two paths of progression are called, of progression are called, the natural love path and the divine love path. So I need to define natural love and define divine love, yes? Natural love is the love that you emanate from your own soul that is totally under your control using your free will. Divine love is the love that God emanates from her soul and can give to you as an individual. Do you see the difference? One of these types of love is coming from within yourself. The other type of love is coming from You can develop, if you develop in divine love, you will automatically have to develop in natural love as well. So the divine love path, if we can call it that, encompasses the natural love path of progression as well. Now, if you decide to be self-reliant, then you are going to automatically be on the natural love path of progression. Because to connect with God you need to become God reliant. If you are very intellectual and deny your emotions you will remain on the natural love path. If you decide to become emotional and focus on your emotions, you have a better chance of being on the divine love path. If you decide that you are God, you will be on the natural love path. Can you see why? How can you feel an emotion of love from a being external to yourself when you think you're that being? Can't get you really. On this path you will say, I am God's child. 
so therefore we are all brothers and sisters. Okay. Can you start seeing a picture of what the two paths are of development? This, both paths involve the dirty word nowadays called morals. Yes, God does have morals that are in harmony with her love. And you will feel them at some point in your development. So if you think you can lie, steal and cheat on any of these paths, you will find you will not be able to get on any of the paths and you will find yourself in the first sphere in a state of stagnation until you work through those particular issues. Hey, Self-reliance is when I only trust myself to determine truth. God-reliance is when I trust the relationship between myself and God to determine truth. Can you see the difference between the two? You can see that most of the time we want to do that because we don't trust anybody external to ourselves. How many of you feel that you really trust somebody? Even your partner. Right? It's hard to trust, isn't it? How do you know for certain what they're going to do? And this is the thing, when you become God-reliant, you begin to trust that relationship because of the emotions that are exchanged between the two of you. Does everyone receive the same amount of love? No. It's totally dependent on desire. But that would be not equal. But no. Would not do this, but would just give everybody an equal amount of opportunity. You just filtered my answer through your emotions. <laughs> yeah? What did I actually say? I said no. I said no to what question? If everybody receives the same amount. Okay. And what did I say was the answer? It was Desire. based on? Desire. Desire. God is wanting to give all of us the same amount of love. Okay. But it depends on your desire to receive it as to how much you will receive. Free will. Because of your free will. God is not going to force you to receive more than you want. To do that would be breaking God's own laws. And she will never do that. She never breaks her own laws. Okay? Alright. So, on the divine love path, you can progress above the sixth sphere and you can process infinitely. And just briefly, what happens on the seventh sphere, above the seventh sphere, is you become born again. Now you're not saying, oh, AJ, you're not born again. You know? <laughs> the soul gets transformed from a human soul into a soul with so much divine love in it that it's actually a different type of creature with different attributes and qualities. And that is the moment you become immortal as well. Right. It's the transformation of the soul and that's why it's called born again or the new birth it's often referred to as in the spirit world. What does that feel like? Um, very hard to describe. There's a, there's a book in the, print, in the uh, DVDs that, I'm, that I've got there. There's a book by Robert James Lees called The Gate of Heaven and in that book he attempts to describe, it's a spirit writing this book, he attempts to describe the process that he went through when he went through the transition in the seventh to the eighth sphere. And my suggestion is, have a read of the three books that he's written because he, he, he actually arrived in the spirit world in the second sphere and it describes all of the things he learnt from that time onwards. What was the title, sorry? Uh, Rob, the writer is Robert James Lees and the three books, the first one is called the, uh, Through the Mists, the second one is called the life of Elysian, and the third one is called the gate of heaven. Will you reincarnate after this eighth year? No. To reincarnate, you must go through a process on the 21st sphere. And the process at the 21st sphere is an amalgamation of the soul, recombining the soul into one. When you're in the 22nd sphere, you now may choose to reincarnate. That's what you've done. You're the first one. I was the first one to ever do it. So the, the spirits in the spirit world know that you've done this? Yes. 
In the celestial spheres, yes. And what's their response? <laughs> what do you mean, what is their response? They would be happy, wouldn't they not? I'm allowed to make my own choices, aren't I? <laughs> What's the, what are you getting at? Well, I mean, are, are, they, are they curious about your experiences or, oh, or do, sure. they, do they want to learn from you? Or? Um, it depends what spirits you're talking to. Like, there are spirits in the sixth sphere who believe they can reincarnate without going through this process. And those particular spirits will never reincarnate as a result while they hold on to those beliefs. And I don't need to reincarnate. So there are many spirits in the 22nd sphere who don't want to come back to Earth and can you blame them? <laughs> really. Yeah. And then do you start then from the other one again? What's the time? You start based on the emotional impressions of your parent state. So in my case, yes, I started back there. Mm -hmm. Why did you mean? Because I want to tell everybody the truth about their life. This stuff. Because of love. Is this the same as what you were saying before? Yes. I didn't know about the 21st fear and the soul union though, back then. <coughs> so I didn't teach the soul union. I did know about soul mates, but I didn't know about the soul union. Can I just add a question there? Um, there's books by James Paget where Jesus um, channeled in 1914 to 1924, which are probably on that other They're all on the CDs and too. And that there, um, explains that you tried to teach the teachings to us on earth through those books and the channelings in 1914 yeah. but it didn't uh, go like a fire through the earth so so quite a number who have returned wrote the messages that you can read that were written in 1914 and they're all on the cds too if you want amazing So the soul needs to go through this soul union process, so I'll just write that down, that's what the spirits call it at that sphere, the soul union process, right? And it's the soul union process that allows the soul to recombine into one, and once the soul has recombined into one, then it has lots of choices available to it, far more than the half of the soul has. The half of the soul needs a body to have sensory input. Do you understand what I meant by that? So right now on Earth, the reason why you've got a physical body is because you need this physical body to interact with the physical world so that your soul can actually absorb the experience. When you're in the spirit world, you will have your spirit body that you use. And to you, it will feel the same as your material body feels now. You can go up and hug another spirit, for example. Right? You even have sexual relationships in the spirit world. Does it feel as good? It feels, good. <laughs> it feels better. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It feels better. Excuse me, did you say you were the, you're the first person to reincarnate? Yep, the first person to reincarnate, reincarnated in 1962. So no other people have reincarnated? Many think they have. Yeah. And we can talk about why. Okay. Sorry, I'm just saying, okay. Um, so we are souls here. We're not. This is our first trip. Uh, not, yeah, uh, for the majority of people in the audience. There's only one. This is not a reincarnation. There's only one other person in this audience who has experienced a reincarnation. This is your son. No. Because she's not in the audience. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So you're trying to trick me. No, no, you're <laughs> <serious. laughs> <laughs> You mentioned Luke and Sarah have reincarnated. Yeah, they are on, they're in Canada. They and Mary has reincarnated. Yes. She, she lives on the Sunshine Coast. Okay, so that's, that's two halves. Sorry, there's, 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 actually, souls. there's actually seven souls who were the first batch of reincarnations, if you like. They found down with you. First batch of eggs, if you like. And makes 14. It's 14 people. 14 people. Do you want me to tell you who they are? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's Mary, myself and Mary. And there's the Apostle John and his soulmate. And his soulmate's a male. Then there's a, a lady called Elisa. And she's mentioned in the Bible, but not under the proper name. And she has a female soulmate. 
then there's uh, a man called Cornelius, who you may have heard from if you read the Bible, and his soulmate. Then there's um, another man called John Mark, and his soulmate. Her, her name's Tabitha. She doesn't like that. And Luke and Sarah. Uh, John the Baptist. Sorry, John the Baptist and his soulmate. And who have I missed? No, no. That's seven. That's seven. Jesus, John, and I have John, Mark, Luke, John, Baptist. Only 12 done. Jesus, John. Two John. This seven. Myself and my, my soulmate there, John's soulmate there, um, Luke's soulmate there, Cornelius. Cornelius' soulmate there, Elisa's soulmate there. Sarah. Uh, that's John the Baptist. Oh, I've told it 14, I'm sure. Yeah, John Mark and John the Baptist. There has been others reincarnated since us uh, as well. Just uh, recently. yeah. But, uh, but the first 14 um, came for a purpose of teaching this material to others. It says in the Bible that God sent His Son to the earth to suffer for the sins of the people. That sounds so like, um, you know, so kind of childish actually to me. You know, why does a person with nothing to do with it, why can't God say, okay, I'll forgive you or whatever, why does he send you to send his son down? Exactly. And, and, and get him crucified or whatever and yeah. die for him? I didn't so, die for anybody's sins. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> yeah. And Thanks there's nothing saying. I can do about your sins. So you're not here to pay us out, teachers? No. <laughs> not here to pay you back, right? <laughs> no, it's, it, these are all teachings of an unloving God. And any time you hear a teaching that refers to an unloving God, it is in error. Why did you die in that and there were a lot of factors at play, and particularly the conflict between truth and error. When you're in a state of truth, you will never compromise. So I didn't compromise in a state of truth in the first century, but there was so much error in the first century that uh, the majority of people around, around me wanted me dead. And they, had, they gave me many warnings first, right? So there were a number of times, one time I was stabbed uh, before my actual death. There was quite a number of times when my life was threatened before my death. Uh, but it was just because of the conflict between truth and error. They had to remove the truth. Sorry? They had to remove the truth. They had to remove the truth in order to remain in the error. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, that's what happens with people in error. When you are in error, you will get angry, you will get upset, you will, and there are many people historically that have that have justified murder because of their anger. <laughs> and they felt they were doing the right thing. There are many of my friends now in the celestial heavens. This area here is called the celestial heavens. And there's many of my friends there who, some of them actually killed me. In fact, one of the persons who returned with me nailed the nails into my hands. Does it jealousy? Yeah. Um, well, jealousy is an emotional untruth. So that's the first thing to understand is we're not talking about untruth. I'm not talking about anything negative. I'm not. No, I'm not talking about anything in terms of intellectual belief. I'm talking about the emotion that drives a person. So jealousy is an emotion of untruth. It's an emotion of error. It's an emotion in disharmony with love. Yeah. Uh, just like all the other emotions. Well. That's a very, very basic summary of the process of incarnation in your own growth, your soul, and so obviously it opens a big can of worms in the sense that there's lots and lots and lots of questions that you probably want to ask, right? And obviously we're not going to have the time to answer them all. But what I would like to do now is to actually have a break so that everyone can relieve themselves and have a bit of a rest outside, have a drink or whatever. Then we will come back and Natalie and myself will actually talk to some spirits and we will actually filter some questions that you might have for those spirits about this stuff. 
So in other words, we don't want to talk to the spirits about, you know, what happened tomorrow or in your life or any of those kind of things, the kind of things we often ask, right? But we're going to talk about whether this stuff is true or not with them. What's been their experience? Do you follow me? It gives you an opportunity to interrelate with the spirit world and ask these questions. Uh, well, you can ask the questions and we'll just refer them to Natalie in her, in her trance state. Does that make sense? So you're not drawing on somebody in your life who's past? No, I, these people that want to come and talk with you have more to do with you than myself. Like, uh, yeah. Why do, people, why do so many people think they have past lives if they don't really? Uh, very good question. And perhaps it will be my last question that I'll answer. Um, I've written a book. I suppose you can call it a book. It's, a, it's just a draft copy. It's 100 pages. And it's for free, so you can just take it with you if you want. It's got qualities of truth and reincarnation and divine love. In there, I list five of the many reasons why many people on earth believe they are reincarnations of somebody. And I'll explain some of them in a minute. And so there's 100 copies of that, so um, you can take whatever you need. If you can leave some for tomorrow's group, we've got about 50 or so coming along tomorrow as well, so if you could uh, leave some for them tomorrow, it'd be good. The explanation is this. If you believe in reincarnation when you pass, what will you try to do? Um, Not necessarily come back. Well, let's say you, you, re you believed in reincarnation on Earth, and when you went up to the spirit world, instead of passing into the nice places of the spirit world, yeah. you passed into the hells of the first sphere, let's say. That's where the hells are in that location. So let's say your surroundings were all dark and dingy and smelly and uncomfortable. What would you want to do? Go up higher. Well, most of them don't even know what's up higher. They want to go back down, in most cases. Because they don't know if there's anything about them. Right? So what they do is they try to connect to another person who's already on earth. And what they try to do is influence that person as much as they possibly can and to remain in connection with them. And the way they do that is by feeding the person images and thoughts and memories of their own life. And when they do that, the person's going to start believing that they had those experiences. Like that? And once you believe something, you now have that attraction between yourself and the spirit. Now, as soon as you develop that attraction with the spirit, that spirit now has the ability to utilize your body, depending on how much you want them to utilize it. Now, this happens all the time with uh, people who are uh, heavy drinkers, for example. So, people, who of you have drunk to the point of oblivion? Yeah. Why do they call it spirits? <laughs> yeah. So, um, what happens there, how many of you have drunk to the point of oblivion but still been standing up and you don't know how you ever got home or anything like that? Has anybody done that? There's, there's a few. Right? What's actually happened is a spirit has connected with you and kept you drinking and kept you awake and kept you alive and, kept, and drove you home for you. So that's why you do stuff that you don't normally do when you drink. That is exactly right. Because you have a stronger connection with the spirit. Who's, who's, that, the reason why the spirit wants it is there's no drink in the spirit world, right? Sorry to disappoint all of you. If you thought there, would be, there is no drink. And so what will you want if you really badly want to drink? You are going to want to get drink from the earth. Because you know that's where you can get it. Now... This is just one of the explanations that I've explained in, in the, the book about why people believe in reincarnation. There are actually people on the natural love path in the sixth year who believe in reincarnation as well. And uh, the reason why is they had a long life of being taught it all the way through their earth life. And they know that it's a fact as well, because they know that since 1962 somebody has done it. So you add those two things together, and so they believe in it very strongly. And you can see historically even that since the 60s, Reincarnation has become a predominant Western teaching, mm -hmm. only since the 60s. Can you see that? Before then, it was predominantly an Eastern teaching. That's your fault, don't you? Yeah, especially <laughs> <laughs>
But it's only since the 60s that that has occurred. Well, you, um, sorry. Sorry. How do you know that for sure? But how do you know that nobody before, um, when we started uh, counting the years like 2,000 years ago, um, I mean, Adam and Eve and whatever, that all the time before them, people... Because I was the first, my soulmate pair was the first pair to enter the 22nd sphere to make it possible. But they, the others had much more time to do this. Uh, yes, but they had not received divine love. It's only possible with divine love. It's only possible with the connection with God. Uh, there are lots of very uh, good people, and, and, and they have received like Moses or Noah or whoever. Certainly, um, certainly. They were on a certain level already at that place. Certainly, but they had not received divine love. Receiving divine love was only possible after I had received it. I know this is going to be very hard for you to, to take, take in, but it's the truth of what happened. Um, in the first century, I was the first person to receive divine love that had ever received divine love on this earth. There's other earths where other people had received divine love. But on this earth, I was the first person to receive it. Somebody's got to be first, right? What about Buddha? Did... Buddha is now in the sixth sphere. <coughs> Muhammad is in the sixth sphere as well. Uh, all in the sixth sphere. Uh, Gandhi, you've heard of Gandhi? No, yeah. Gandhi's in the celestial spheres. Who else do you want to ask about? <laughs> Mother Teresa is in the fifth sphere. Had we known this when you were here? Well, you can talk to your spirit friends whenever you like, right? You can find out these things, and you can also. Every one of you spend your life in the sleep state in the spirit world. You just don't remember it. Nelson Mandela might be. Where he may have been or is? In the sphere. In terms of his condition now? He, uh, he was in his lifetime of helping... Has he passed recently, is he? Oh, no, sorry. I think it was the same place. I'm not going to comment about, oh, the, about where everyone is in their awake state. Does God have a desire for us as souls? Yes. God has a desire to, to, for you to experience her love. And, and her desire is, one thing you will come to realise is her desire is so powerful that it will constantly overwhelm you on the path of divine progression. Right? The desire that God has for you is burning within her constantly. Um, if you have been described as a son of God, how does that just make us all? Children of God. We are all sons all, and daughters all of God. The same. Not yes. you, not just something different. Well, only in your progression. Well, in the first century, the reason why I described myself as the son of God was because I was the first child of God to actually become a son at the soul level. Do you understand what I mean by that? The soul level, becoming a son of God at the soul level means receiving divine love to the point of being born again as a child. Born again, not as a physical child, but as a child at the soul level in a relationship with God. If every one of you can go through this process, you will experience some amazing experiences if you choose to. Right? And, and that process of being born again makes you a true son of God or daughter of God. Up until then, you are a child of God at the soul level in the sense that God created you, but you are unaware of the relationship. When you become aware of the relationship is when you enter the eighth sphere. And you now are perfectly aware of your true relationship with God. You have the power to heal other humans when you were first on this planet. Yes. Did that come through the divine love of God? Yes. Or was that through the gift that God gave to you? No, all, all of the things I have ever done have all been the result of the divine love flowing through me. It, none of it has been me. And, and honestly, all the things that you will come to do, you will find, uh, you, if you're on this path, it will all be because of your intention. On this path, you'll find that everything that comes to you will be because of that connection. It's exactly the same. If there's somebody in this room who has an ongoing illness, are you able to help them? Yes, but I, the way I want to help them is, is by addressing the real cause. And what did I say earlier? The real cause is emotional. So while I'm happy to heal a person, and, and I'm not 
doing this at the moment for, for reasons I can explain later. But while I'm happy to do that, I would prefer to actually to teach the person how to heal themselves. You can see why, can't you? Yeah. And someone over here. Yeah. Um, as a child, I leaned very much with Jesus, and I've grown up with this intense love. And even now, I when I meditate, I call in that energy. Is that? Are you aware of that? I know it's that energy. Yeah. Now I'm aware of everything that's going on to a degree. At the moment, I've still got certain fears within myself, and um, that causes me to remain unaware about about some things. And I was just discussing them with a few people the other day of some of those fears that I'm working through at the moment. But I am very much aware, oftentimes, of people communicating with me and feeling different feelings and so forth, right the way around the world, not just not just a few people. There will come a time in your own life, actually, where you will be able to feel every single person's emotion everywhere. And like in this room, you'll be able to feel every single person's emotion. You'll actually know what every cause of their emotion is. You'll know what experience created that emotion. You'll know that they're choosing either to release it or not release it. You'll know everything. I don't know at all, but... Sorry? Well, you can choose to do it. This is what I'm saying, it's just a choice. If you choose to do that, that's what will happen. You will have these experiences that are currently, most often, unknown on the earth. Can you explain, or can you describe for us the experience of receiving divine love in your first incarnation? Um, it began at such a young age for me in the first incarnation that some of the initial experiences are very, very difficult for me to accurately describe. But perhaps I can describe some of them that occurred during my teenage years uh, in the first century. And what will happen is you will have a... a, a um, most of you have gone into a meditative state, yes? And in that meditative state have fe felt a feeling of lightness and so forth. Well, what will happen during those experiences if you long to God for God's love to enter you is that it, there will be an emotional flow of a feeling of love from God to yourself that you will recognise. And it will not only be a vibration, so it's an energy feeling as well, but it will also trigger emotions within you. So all of a sudden you'll burst out in lots of different emotions as well as part of that process. Tears? And, well, for most of us in the, now, well, yes, we have a lot of sadness, so tears are going to probably be in company with it. Is this causing joy? Sorry? Causeless joy. Is this the... Causeless joy. Well, well I don't think joy. there's no such thing as causeless joy. Well, it's but not something that you witness that makes you smile. It's something that just happens. You know, it just comes. Yeah, but, but everything is with a cause. And a cause, something that just comes is usually there's interaction, interrelationships going on at the spirit level and at the soul level with God that you're currently unaware of because you don't wish to be aware of because of certain emotions within. So there is, a, there is always a cause for every single thing that occurs within you. But I know a lot of times today people say that it's causeless. You know, but, but the cause is often God. So did you see things? Yes, yes. Um, what, I would, what I would do at another time, perhaps, is describe a lot of these things if people are interested in having me back. <laughs> um, the, the best thing I can do now is have the break because I know a lot of you are wanting the break badly. And, and what we'll do is we'll leave that on the board and then involve our spirits in the, involve some spirits in the conversation so that you can ask some questions from them as well. You can even ask them about me if you want. Uh, if you think I'm a charlatan or whatever, you can ask them how they think I am. So perhaps we have a break uh, back at uh, 4.30.